as we listen to Simon praying there for the work of City Mission and for what's happening in the country, you know, we can't help but be challenged that we need to be involved in mission, don't we? We need to be people that are challenged by mission, getting stuck into mission, that it's essential for us. Um, so the story so far, um, if you've been with us all these weeks, uh, I'm not sure how many will manage all of that, but the story for, so far would be that I kicked off, uh, well, seven, seven weeks ago when we looked at st- some stuff in the Old Testament, we looked at how Israel was to be a blessing to the nations. Then we moved on to uh, looking at fearless fishermen uh, with, with John Crabe, then John Burns on sowing and reaping. Craig looked at us being people of influence. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, John Craig was back on looking about how we need to be spirit-empowered witnesses. And then last week, if you were here, um, John Burns was on messy mission, how mission gets messy when you get stuck into it. Um, and you'd think, actually, by the time we get to this week, actually, it might be more appropriate to say, well, we've heard it all. Get off your seats Go on, get out there. Let's go out and let's pray for the sick and let's, let's, let's speak peace into people's lives and let's just get out and do it because actually this is a practical subject, isn't it? Uh, it has to be practical. It has to be something that impacts our lives. Um, but we are going to take one more, uh, one more uh, Sunday to do this. Um, the exciting thing is that it's not just going to be listening to me this morning, uh, but it's, um, a wee bit later... Uh, Don, Don McLean is going to come up, and, uh, and Jill Morrison is going to come, come up as well, and we're going to listen about some steps that they have taken over months, the recent months and years to be involved in different mission activities, so I'm looking forward to listening to them. If you are looking at your uh, notice sheet uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, you might have seen that actually the topic that was put down for this week I had originally put it down as integral mission. Integral mission. Uh, integral mission is something that I, I get excited about. It may not be a phrase that you've heard about an awful lot. Um, actually, we're not going to really talk about that. But really, it's something that we have been covering. It's about the fact that if we are really going to be involved in mission, if we're going to be people who, who take mission seriously, it has to be about every area of our lives. It's not something that is restricted to Sunday. It's not something that is restricted to just certain things, but it's something that impacts every area of our lives. I was at a conference um, quite a long time ago, um, actually out in Mexico where this was discussed and where uh, where they talked about how how we need to be uh, integral in the way that we do that. And it was an interesting little story, I'll tell, because actually it comes out of a South American uh, phrase because uh, they were trying to translate this idea of being holistic, being involved in mission in all areas of our lives, which was a a sort of a a phrase that's come out of the English language, and they wanted to translate it. Uh, And when it went across to Spanish-speaking countries, they said, well, we will use the the word integral. Um, And apparently, I'm not an expert in languages at all, but I, I like the, the, where this comes from, is that the idea of being integral is that it's, it's something that cannot be separated into its constituent parts. So if it's integrated, you actually put it together, you put all the little bits together, and, and it comes to be the whole thing. But if it's integral, it's something that cannot be separated. And I like that idea, and I was going to talk more about that, but we'll, we'll, we'll park it. Um, but that idea that actually... If we're going to be involved in mission, it is about our whole lives because we have to be people of integrity. We have to be people that live this stuff out. It must, it must be involved in, in every, every, every area of our lives. And actually, they come up with this phrase, which they said was that as we proclaim the gospel, as we speak out the words of truth of the gospel, then it must have implications for the way that we get involved in people's lives. It must have social implications, so that as we proclaim words of truth from the Bible, from the words of truth of Christ, it must have implications in our lifestyle. And equally, as we seek to be involved in people's lives, we must speak out the words of Jesus as we do that. So it's, it's that idea that we don't separate it out, but it's got to be about every area of our life. And that 
We'll, I'm sure we'll touch on that later on this morning, um, but I'm not going to spend more time on that because I really wanted to build on where John got to last week, um, which is about being risk takers, about getting out there, about doing it, uh, and really, if there is a title, it's, it's time for action, it's time to let's, to let's do this, it's time to get off our seats, it's time to be out there and, and figuring out how we can be involved in mission. But I want to start, uh, as we explore this, I do want to start with looking at the Bible together. Um, and we're going to read this morning from Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and, and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and uh, the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do work which God, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this is from um, a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Um, it's written to the church in Ephesus, um, a city in the, in the Middle East, um, which he, would have, uh, he, was, he, he was responsible for getting that church started. It's also a church where he probably spent about three and a half years. So it's a, a church which he's very interested in. He's a church which he feels a close affinity for. So he's um, taking his interest and he's expressing it back to this church. It's interesting to note that Ephesus at that time was a really key and important place. It was a major city. It was a port. Um, it was a center of trade. It would have been a wealthy city. Uh, it was also the center of idol worship. Um, at that time, there was a huge big temple um, to the goddess Artemis. Uh, it was a center of, of temple prostitution, so it's full of immorality. Um, it was a place, really, uh, where anything goes, where there were really no rules, uh, where people felt they could, they could do what they want. Uh, it was a place um, that would have been deficit, really, of any sense of morality, um, and it would, the whole thing was about just do what you want, get rich, please yourself, that type of idea. And uh, as we contemplate, as, that, as, we, as we look at that, we think, well, is that massively different from the context in which we live today, where people really uh, want to always put themselves first? Um, and as we, uh, if we were to explore more time uh, in the book of uh, Ephesians, we'd see that actually in chapter 1, uh, Paul um, spends time just giving thanks for the gospel, giving thanks that, that the church has responded to the gospel, giving thanks to the work of Christ. And he just introduces them with a lot of thanksgiving about all that, that, that Christ has done, all that God is doing in the church. And then uh, we get into chapter 2. Uh, and I just want to spend a little bit of time on this as an introduction to where we're going this morning. Uh, and, and, he, and he goes straight in from there in chapter 2. But as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. I'm not sure um, if I had been the recipient of that letter, how I would have reacted to, uh, to that um, when I got it. You know, I've heard all this encouraging stuff about how, uh, you know, the, the, the Christ came and, and all the encouraging stuff of, from Paul just to introduce the letter to us. And then he goes, bang, 
But as for you, you are dead in your transgression, transgressions and in your sins. And I think I would have probably got a little bit defensive. I'd have said, well, you know, I do one or two little things wrong. I know from time to time I might not get it all right. I might not always be the kindest person. You know, I try and tell truth, but I might bend it a little bit. But, but isn't this too strong, calling me dead in my transgressions? Um, and isn't that too harsh? Uh, but Paul wants it to be clear in this letter that all of us have made bad choices. Um, ultimately, we've made choices that separate us from God. But then he goes on to say, but here's the good news. God has also made a choice that because of Christ Jesus, you are saved. And what I like about this passage and what I want to use it to introduce where we're going with this is this contrast that it expresses. So we've got at the beginning, we've got all this stuff about death and about sin and about being lost, about disobedience, about wrath. And it's all, oh, you know, everything is a mess, and, and you're part of the mess, and it's the choices you've made that are, have made you part of the mess, and, and, you've got, and you, you deserve the wrath that's coming to your, your way. And Paul is very blunt about it, but it, then he goes on to say, but the good news is that in Christ Jesus there is new life. Uh, and, then we get, and then we get into all these phrases that we are raised up, that there is life, that it's the free gift of God, that God has saved us, that we're God's handiwork, that we're seated with him in the heavenly realms. You know, all the good stuff is there. And the contrast couldn't be stronger. The contrast between life without Christ and life with Christ couldn't be stronger. If we're going to get hold of mission, we have to understand that, don't we? We have to understand that we bring a message of good news. Now, I don't, I'm not one of these people that has a testimony that, you know, I can say I was involved in all sorts of amazingly bad, awful, terrible things with a life of crime and doing all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, and there, I know people that have done that have been saved from that and have got amazing testimonies. But I know that I'm capable of, of terrible things. I know that all the time I have to make choices to, to follow God, and I'm, I'm capable of doing terrible things. And it is only by, because of all that God has done for me that I can make better choices in, in our life. So the good news is that God has a plan for us, that God has a plan for us to be seated with him, to, to, to be part of his plan, to be part of his creation, to do, to do good things. He, want us to, he wants us to be living out our lives the way that God intended. John spoke about this last week with Jonah uh, and about how you know, Jonah had the message uh, for the people of Nineveh that God had a plan for the people of Nineveh, but they had to repent from that place of darkness. They had to repent, repent from the place of wrongdoing in order to grasp hold of the plan that God had for them, the good plan. I spoke about it when I, when I talked about the Old Testament, that God had a plan for the people of Israel. But the, and the plan for the people of Israel was that they would be a nation that was different, that, they, that as a nation they wouldn't be basing their choices on, on, on selfishness and just looking after themselves, but they would be basing their nation on choices of following God in order that they could be a blessing to the nations. And so I, I love this passage because it, it talks about how things were and how things were messed up, and then it talks about how God has done it for us, and that he has a plan for us. Um, and I, and I love, I love uh, verse, verse 10 especially, because it goes on to say, not only are you saved, but you're saved by God's grace. You can't earn it, but you're saved in order to do the, go the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. And that is the sense of mission, isn't it? that God has done this work in us in order that we live out our lives in a missional, in a transformation way. Um, and and uh, that's what we want to look at this morning. We want to explore this more about how we are being transformed in order to be involved in the work of transformation. And that involves getting out there, getting involved in messy stuff, and getting involved in people's lives. So, 
I thought rather than just, you know, me tell stories this morning, it would be good to hear from some others. So I'm going to invite uh, Jill, Jill Morrison and Don, Don McLean to come and join me here and we're going to uh, involve them in this. I'll let me get the microphones. Don't just stand there, come and join me. Here we go. Um, yeah. No, if we stand slightly back, as a sound person, the worst thing you can do is stand underneath a speaker. Because um, that's what... So, just a little aside for everybody. If you stand down there with a roaming microphone, you're underneath that speaker. Sorry, that's a sound engineer speaking there. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just helping up John in the box. Let's, let's, let's get into why we're here. So, mission. Uh, so, the reason I've invited Don and Jill up here is they're both uh, people who have made choices over the last few years, choices to do things differently. Uh, I should say, for Don, it's important to say he didn't make that choice on his own. It's very much Don and Lorna together, and we were thinking about having Lorna up here as well, but uh, I think it was agreed that maybe it was okay for you just to be the spokesperson this morning. Lorna would probably talk too long. Well, she takes it. <laughs> Jill, let, let's start with you. Um, so, take us back a couple of years. What were you doing? And so I don't keep interrupting. Yeah, okay. where, where, where have you taken that? And uh, what, what has God led, in, led you into? Okay, um, I have been involved in this church for about 12 or 13 years with my husband, Graham, and we had three boys. Uh, I uh, was a pediatric dietitian and I worked at York Hill um, for about 12 years. Um, I did kind of sense as the children grew up and started to move away that actually maybe God had another chapter in my life. I wasn't quite sure what that was. Um, we started running uh, the Barista Cafe in here uh, just over two years ago. Uh, I, and then just over a year ago, uh, I really took the step that actually rather than just coasting to retirement and carrying on doing my job and just dabbling in different things, that I would leave my job uh, and invest in what God was speaking to me about the cafe. Uh, it was a bit of a leap of faith. There have been a number of things going on in our lives that had probably helped to push me over the edge. Um, so... Uh, I had really a real passion, I think, from God to, to develop a ca kind of community cafe that helped uh, the socially isolated in our community. So the cafe was a huge success, um, but now we've changed it slightly, and I'll talk about that more, but it's really about the fact that I'm now also doing this course. Uh, <clears throat> I felt God had to teach me more. So I'm now doing this course, a church pioneering course, which is about new ways of doing church, and it's run by Forge Scotland. And I'm going to talk a wee bit later on about some of the challenging things that that, that course is encouraging me to do. Brilliant. Thank you, Jill. And Don, uh, life has changed a lot for you also in the last couple of years. Do you want to, uh, for you and Lorna, do you want yeah. to just tell us a little bit that journey and what that's led, to, led you to now? Uh, well, three or four years ago, um, we were um, just uh, jogging through life, as, as we all kind of like to try and do. Um, I was uh, running an architect's practice, had been for about 20 years. Lorna was um, a team lead for the uh, infectious diseases, um, sorry, bloodborne virus um, uh, department in uh, the Brownlee Centre. So we were both... Um, you know, our kids were starting to um, leave the house. I mean, they, didn't, they started to leave the house an awful lot of times, and it just never quite took a long time anyway. So that, that started to look as if that was all going to happen. And we were, I, I guess we were just beginning to think about coasting down the road to retirement, to be honest. Um, counting the number of holidays a year and um, stuff like that. So, and that, you know, that, that was fine. That's, that's what we were doing. And... Um, we were involved in a few things. We were involved in some, we were involved in church and involved in a few things outside of church. But I mean, really, about um, four years ago now, 
um, God just um, spoke into our lives and, and basically was made clear that things were going to change. And we took a decision at that very point in time that whatever it was, God would say, we would say yes. And that sounds very dramatic and very um, wholesome of us, but actually it just didn't seem like a choice, actually. <laughs> when God speaks that directly into your life, it's a kind of difficult thing to say no. So um, over the next couple of years, we, we kind of went down a journey where we, that began to crystallize, and it's ended up with us um, being in uh, South Africa. We're, we're here just now for Lorna's treatment, but we're, we, we base, we're based in Cape Town, and Lorna's working in a township um, doing health promotion and education, and I'm working housing in another township. Fantastic. So, so we're, one of the, the reasons I was really keen to uh, get, get Don and Lorna, uh, and Don with Lorna and Jill to share, was that um, I believe it's really important that, we, that we're constantly people who are learning. Uh, and one of the places we learn is when we're pushed into a place of maybe a little bit of discomfort and we're pushed out on the edge more. And and I think it's fair to say that uh, both in Jill's case and in Don and Laura's case, they've taken risks. They've pushed themselves out there to do something a little bit uncomfortable, maybe not not the thing that they would necessarily have chosen to do. So, uh, Jill, go on and tell us a little bit about how you've been learning through that, and, and especially within this whole context of mission about being out there. Uh, what is it you've learned um, from getting involved in the barista, in the forge course? Uh, I'm sort of opening the door for okay. you to, to yeah. share with us here. So I suppose I feel a bit of a fraud because I'm still living in a nice house in Mulgai eh, eh, and compared to what Don and Lorna have been doing, it doesn't feel to me like a massive physical sacrifice. Um, But I do feel I am responding to what God has asked me to do and that has made me have to give up my job and everybody thinks I'm retired, which I get really, really annoyed about. (laughs) (laughs) because I'm far too young to be retired. Um, But I think one of the things that I am really learning is about listening to God. And I don't think I've ever really done that as consciously as I have now, partly because I have time and I have made the last... The first 12 months that I left work, I made a conscious effort to start each day listening to God to give, to give me direction. And obviously in a busy life, it's really hard to do that, but I just, I made that decision. And the more I responded to what I felt God was saying, the more I could see God doing things in my life. And in the life of, of the barista cafe and what I was doing, and I found that it was quite amazing. Uh, and I've learned that I've got to be bold. I'm, I am quite a quiet person. Uh, and quite reluctant to stand up and do something that is a wee bit different to what everyone else is doing, and yet God has absolutely asked me to do that. Uh, and one of the things on the course, the first thing that we ha- we have these five residential weekends, and I'm away with all these people that are doing amazing things, and here's middle class me. You know, rolling up in my car, uh, just saying, oh, I'm come from Bearsden. And it just feels a bit weird <laughs> compared to what everyone else is doing. But the first, the first sort of activity they asked me to do was to go and ask five people what they think about God, church, faith, and spirituality. And it had to be people that weren't involved. So I couldn't just go around all you lot and say, well, I have what you think. I had to go and ask the people that come to the cafe. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to do that. But God really did give me the boldness I needed to ask these questions. And the answers I got were just amazing. It just opened doors. I had to explain that I was a woman of faith, but that I understood that maybe church was increasingly irrelevant for people and what did they really think and just was amazing. And it has given me opportunity to build relationships with these people, uh, to share life in a way that I would never have been able to do uh, in any other context. 
So God has made me much more bold, and I really have to listen. So I think that's probably the, the, one of the main things I've learned so far. One thing I'm just get uh-huh. interested to explore with you, because I think people, people who don't know the whole story may still wonder about this. When you first started the cafe here, uh, for a year, it, it grew pretty quickly. It was in this, in this room, those of you who may have turned up, and there were a lot of people coming. <laughs> it was, uh, if you'd look from outside, it became a success quite yes. quickly, didn't it? Because success, mm-hmm. we think about numbers, and we think about the number of coffees we're selling and stuff mm-hmm. like that. You took a, uh, what a lot of people wonder, a strange decision mm-hmm. to say, no, yeah. that's okay. not what we're looking at. Um, we yeah. want, it's, it should be something different. Just okay. explain to us why you did that. Well, the, my original vision that I, I felt God gave me was for a, a, a small cafe where I could meet with people and talk to them and build relationships. It was in a garden, which I thought was quite interesting. And, and the idea really was to have the cafe in the foyer. So I set up three or four tables in the foyer and like within weeks there was no way that that could be there it had to be in this church and we had this massive laterally we had maybe 60 or 70 people coming with prams and it was really busy and it was really successful in worldly terms Um, but we weren't talking to people because there was no time we were so busy and it's about building relationship I did learn a lot about how to manage a cafe which was really helpful But when the old building became available, we thought, right, we're going to shut this down because we're not not building relationships here. And we opened it up through in the other area. Um, And that was, I I felt for me, that was a huge risk because we were having to tell all the people that had come before that actually we weren't doing it this way anymore. And some people weren't very happy about it. But the difference now is we actually getting to know people. We're building relationships with the people that come week in, week out. We've been able to pray for people, uh, so people whose lives are really struggling, and it's only because we're able to sit down and talk with people that we've been able to find that out. People who's, they may be dealing with family members who've got cancer, maybe marriages that are in difficulty, uh, and that would never have happened in this big space. So it is about building relationships and sharing lives, sharing, and, and, and us, and all the volunteers, it's not me. In most cases, it's not me who's talking to people. It's all the other volunteers who are asking, how's your day? And some people will open up at that point, uh, and we're able to share life with them. If we, if we were doing this with a, with a whiteboard, we'd be writing some notes, wouldn't we? <laughs> so people, yeah. uh, listening to God, relationships... Um, community, community, <coughs> sense of belonging. I think as well for some of the children that come, they're saying to their mums, "Can we go to Barista today? Can we go?" If their mum gives them choices, the children are choosing to come to Barista, and, and that f- is creating a kind of sense of family and belonging, which I think is quite important as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. Don, let's step back um, and really come back to that uh, that question. So you go from. Bears Den from being involved in an in architect's practice to Lorna being involved in, uh, in healthcare, and you step out your comfort zone completely into something completely different. Mm. What has God been teaching you? I mean, I probably would open up the door for a long time here, wouldn't I? But, but what are the key things that God has been teaching through, you through that by going into a different context? <clears throat> well, the listening to God, but um, I mean, when we heard that word from God about our lives shifting, we, we, you know, we did ask ourselves a question. Maybe God's been shouting for quite a long time, and we haven't been, we haven't been listening. Um, and that could, that might be the case, um, but the timing of it all felt right. And and you know, I'd like to say that we were, um, we were uh, very diligent spiritually in listening after that point, but actually, we just couldn't avoid God. <laughs> We just, everywhere we turned, we just, we tripped over. So, you know, it started to kind of crystallize the idea of South Africa. We just, um, everywhere we turned, not to try and escape the thing, but it was like another step was presented to us, um, and we had said we would say yes, so we took the next step and the next step and the next step. Um, so, the listening to God but I have to say, it's probably the easiest period of listening to God in our entire lives because um, we just couldn't escape what God was saying to us. Um, 
you know, and in terms of the transition to South Africa, um, you know, we, I was involved, I was involved in church and leadership and stuff like that, and Lorna was involved in prayer groups, and we were all, you know, we were kind of doing stuff, we were involved in street pastors, so our, our focus, we always felt, was people, I was always least comfortable in the deacon's court, we were talking about programs and, and things like that, I was more interested in, in people, so that's, you know, that feels like who I am to some extent, but when this all started and this journey started, all of a sudden we're talking, you know, we're, we're trying to work out and trying to visualize what our life in South Africa is like. What work has God got for us to do? What is all this about? And you start visualizing programs. And, you know, for me, it was, um, I, was I, I began to hear through, through someone, uh, through Alison Christie, actually, who put me, you know, there was one of the steps to Barry Lewis, the guy I work with in, in South Africa, started looking at the work he was doing, got really interested, because I'm an architect, so I was really interested in the housing, the technology, and it felt like the right thing, and it was the right thing. But eventually we decided we had to go and see. And that's a powerful thing to go and see. You know, it'd be a powerful thing for you to go and see the night shelter in operation, if you have never done it before or to join street pastors observing if you've never done it before. It's just powerful to be there doing it and seeing it. So we went out there for a couple of weeks to, to Cape Town, and I've still got programs in my head. You know, what is this going to look like? What, you know, what projects are we going to, you know, how did we get housing built? And actually, my first visit to Sweet Home Farm just broke my heart. And you, you suddenly realize that it's actually just about people again. You can go 6,000 miles away and it's still about people. And, um, you know, the, the problems are huge and, and the numbers are vast, but it's down to what you can do for the person in front of you. Now, that seems overly simplistic, but it's just true. And you can't, you can't run away from that. So is that, I don't want to go on and on. Um, no, but, I mean, you, and what was the sort of... I mean... We'd love to learn about it specifically in South Africa, specifically within the context, not just that you work, but the Lorna works um, as well. What are the, what were some of the specific things that came out within that context? You've spoken to me about, you know, there's a there's a sense of, you know, injustice, justice, oh, injustice, yeah, 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 all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we went... For a couple of minutes for you. Yeah, yeah, well, we went to Cape Town, you know, thinking, I did a lot of reading before we went as well, you know, thinking I was getting all my facts in the right order and trying to work out what apartheid was all about and trying to understand how it affected different people groups and stuff. But actually, until you get there and you live there and you actually start mixing with the different people groups you're talking about, the number of perspectives on the problems is huge. Um, and I think, you know, we're still learning that. We still, I mean, I think years from now, we'll still be learning that. It's a very, very complex um, problem. So you can be overwhelmed. You know, you can be overwhelmed by the problems and the complexity of it. Um, and for, for, the first, um, for the first number of months, I struggled personally with the whole idea of my significance. What is it? Why did God bring me here? Because you suddenly think you, you must have... I must have something special to bring, or something. And actually, as time passes, you realize you, you don't have anything special to bring. But being here is important, because that's what God's asked, asked, asked me to do. Um, and we, 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 we have a, a saying um, uh, that, that came from a conference in, in South Africa, that there's power in proximity. And there is real power in being alongside people. And did I say to, to, to kind of twin that back to here, that's still just as true here. You don't have to go 6,000 miles away to discover that. There is power in proximity. There's power in being alongside people and being involved with their lives. And that brings, you know, if, as God works through you, that brings power to the situation that doesn't exist before. So that's kind of Brilliant. some of the things yeah, I've learned. Thank you. And again, if we'd had the whiteboard, we'd have been putting that out, wouldn't we? It's about walking and journeying with uh, people through the circumstances that they're in, yeah, uh, whether yeah. that be, hope, you know, being a housing thing or whether it be HIV or whether it be oh. other, other issues, it's journeying with them and being with them in that, yeah, in yeah. that and, context. And working in the community, the other thing as well, you know, working in communities in South Africa and in Cape Town, you know, the history of this is that there's all sorts of charities going and they act as, you know, they're like the white saviours, we, we turn up, we know, we know what you need and we'll give you what you need, and you can be grateful for it. 
Well, that's, that's history. That doesn't happen. Doesn't, well, it does happen, but it doesn't work anymore. And in Sweet Home Farm, the leader will tell me, um, nothing for us without us, right? So don't do anything for us without being involved with us. And it's like, um, we're not there to run programs. We're back to that again. We're there to walk a journey with people and to get alongside their pain and to get alongside their suffering and, and to be with them. I, I came across this, actually Lorna came across this um, from uh, Mother Teresa said this, I never look at the masses as my responsibility. I look only at the individual. I can love only one person at a time, just one, one, one. And despite the numbers and overwhelming nature of the, the kind of situation we're involved in, that's what it feels like. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you, Don. Um, so looking ahead, um, and again, just keeping this in the context, we're learning together about mission, about doing it, about getting out there. Um, Jill, what, what, what's lying, what lies ahead now? What's exciting in terms of uh, 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 for you and maybe Barista, the Forge course? Um, tell us what's, uh, what's coming up. Well, I think one of the things that I really f think we can kind of push into now is about looking at, at the needs of the community. And up when we initially set up, it was mostly mums and babies that we were attracting. But the, there is a whole need out there for, for all ages, people who feel socially isolated. It might be adults uh, with learning difficulties. It might be older people whose children have all moved away and they just ha are struggling uh, by themselves. So we're really looking to develop a barista as an intergenerational space where people of all ages can come. We've now got two rooms. We've got a quiet room and a kind of all singing, all dancing room, <laughs> depending what people wish. Uh, we're going to get some flyers developed because uh, we've just been advertising ourselves on Facebook, which just narrows our market right down. So we're going to uh, go across the street to the flats and up and down the road and just let people know that there is a cafe here a couple of days a week. Um, so I think these are things that really excite me. What, I re what really excites me is the possibility that people might find Jesus. Because that's what we're about. We want to share what we've got, hear what we know here with more people. And when you see people who are broken and hurting and you know that God can help them, I think that's, again, back to the boldness again. If I start asking questions and you start to uncover these things, you realize that actually I have a strength that God gives me that, you know, that it would be wonderful if you could experience that too. Uh, and I think just... The, uh, linking in with the other things that are going on here. So we've got Bumps and Bundles, and we've got people from Bumps and Bundles who are coming to Barista, and it, so there's a sort of symbiotic relationship. And it, also with Lunch Break, it'd be lovely to develop an opportunity for people who come to Lunch Break who might be able to come out another day uh, and just come and have a cup of coffee and, and build relationships that way. But for most of you who are sitting here, probably you're at work. <laughs> So it's a building, but it's about where your front line is. For me now, my front line is our community. But for some of you, it will be your workplace. And it goes back to building relationships um, and being in genuinely interested in where people are uh, and just getting alongside them, wherever you are. <laughs> so it might be in the supermarket, it might be at school, it might be at university, it might be in work. Uh, and that's, I think, what God's really teaching me uh, now uh, about being bold and just sharing something of him with others. Fantastic. And for those that aren't at work during the day on Wednesday and Thursday... They... Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning, you'd be very welcome to, to come along and bring your neighbours, friends, different contacts. And we're all, the other thing that we're exploring is with Alzheimer's Scotland and maybe having an activity afternoon running at the same time as Barista, which would allow people to come and the carers to come and have a cup of coffee. So that's, that's in the pipeline. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and Don, for your... Uh, for you and Lorna, um, so not long now mm. until uh, you return to, to, to South Africa. Um, 
I guess there'll be a whole lot of mixture of emotions going on in, in <laughs> regard to that, which maybe better not yeah. open up all of that. But, no, 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 no. but tell me what, what's exciting about um, Ahead and what you're looking forward to. Yeah, well, we are, we are absolutely beside ourselves to get back. Um, but we're not looking forward to leaving, if you understand what I mean. So, it's, um, it's interesting because we've been in a bit of a vacuum in the last few months. It's been a kind of strange and frustrating vacuum. Obviously, Lorna has been going through treatment and that's going really well. And we're now at the point where we're, we're booking flights today, I think, um, for the middle of January. And, um, you know, we're going to go back there and we're going to find that... You know, we could, we could be forgiven for thinking we can just pick up where we left off, but that wouldn't be the case because things have moved on, relationships have moved on, um, new people will be uh, around. So we, we need to go back in and we need to uh, back into those situations and, and allow ourselves to ease, um, you know, back into those relationships because, you know, there's a, there's a real feeling in Cape Town quite often um, people come from charities and they come and they spend time and then, you know, within a year or something, they leave. And they've usually got a good excuse to leave, but they leave, you know, and maybe we'll say, we'll probably come back, and they never come back. So it's going to be a big thing, I think, for the people we do work with that we do actually turn up. Um, and, and um, I mean, we have, we have programs that are about people to progress, and Lorna desperately wants to... She's been invited. Lorna works in a different township in Gugaletu from um, Sweet Home Farm, but she's been invited in by the leader at Sweet Home Farm to come and start working there. And that's wrapped up with the community hall, which we now have the funding for, but it's not quite got very far through the community yet because of disruption that's happened over the summer. So I'll get into that maybe tonight if you're coming along. But there, there's a huge amount of excitement for us about the potential for that community hall to be built, for Lorna to start working in Sweet Home Farm and expanding the stuff at Kainisa. And for, there, there is every possibility now that in partnership with the city, we can actually start building houses this year. But this is Africa. And you know, whenever you start getting excited, there are frustrations come along. So it's going to be some extent more of, more of that. You know, we have, to, we have to just be prepared that things won't push forward as much as we, 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 we've got this pent-up excitement from six months of being here, wanting to get back. But actually, we need to slow down a bit and get into the programme again, you know, into the, the way things are done in Africa. So I can't say much more than that, except, um, you know, can't wait to get back. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you. I think we'll uh, leave this bit here, but thank you. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, Don and Lorna are going to be speaking this evening. Um, uh, it's 7.30 here. Um, please, please come along uh, and listen to more of, uh, about that and about uh, catch up with them about how things are going to progress. Even if you don't, can't normally get out on a Sunday evening, please try and find a way of getting out this Sunday evening and join uh, and, and support Don and Lorna in that way because um, that, that will be absolutely fantastic. But, you know, if we were to try and sum up what we've been listening. I mean, the two things uh, uh, that, that have struck, struck me uh, listening to, to Jill share and to, Do, to Don share there uh, is absolutely about people, isn't it? It's absolutely about people. It's about the people that are here in Bears Den and Mulgai, uh, that come along to the cafe that we engage with there. It's about the people out there uh, in South Africa, in Cape Town, in Sweet Home Farm, in the other community that Lorna works in, Gugulatu. Oh, I'll, I'll never get that right. But anyway, but it's about people, isn't it? But it's about the potential also that as, as, as people are being transformed by mission, and you listen to what, what, what Jill pointed out there, the excitement, the potential for people hearing the good news of Jesus into their lives and about the potential for them being transformed with that. And as we, as we understand that, the potential for that going out and doing and transforming the community, and um, we we should not underestimate what God can do through mission. And and when I was thinking about this, and I was trying to think about how how, how to tie it up, um, the, the, this this thought came to mind. Mission is exciting because it changes us. So as we have listened to uh, the Bible over the last few weeks, 
I'm hoping that it's changed us. I'm hoping that it's changed me as I've understood more, as I've studied it, as I've listened to stories. I'm hoping that it's changed me. And as I go out and, and I'm more passionate about this, I will be different, and I will be more missional, I will be more keen to be out there. Mission is exciting because it changes us as individuals. It makes us to be about people, it stops us being selfish, I hope. It gives us a desire to be out there helping, you know, helping change people. Mission is also, I think, exciting for us as a church because it will change us as a church. That's, that's awkward, that's difficult, that's risky, isn't it? How will mission change us as a church? Is this mission? This is part of mission. We learn together, we enjoy worshiping together, but this can't be the whole thing, can it? And one of the reasons we wanted to have that session uh, that John did last week about calling it messy mission is if we're going to be involved in mission, it's going to be messy, it's going to be out there. It's going to be involved in people's lives who are messed up. It's expecting to people to come into our church whose lives are not all sorted and for us to be available for them and us to interact with them and us to care about them. But as, a, as a church, it may mean that we do things differently. I don't know. But if we're going to be really involved in mission, we have to allow the prospect of it changing us. Because most people are not in church on a Sunday morning, let's face it. Most people are out there doing other things. Uh, and so if we just are here, we're not engaging with them. And if, if we're not, during the week we're just doing our own little things and we're not really interested in people, we're not going to engage with them. So mission will also change the church. It changes us as individuals. It, should, it will and it should change the church. And the exciting thing is it should also change the community. Now, you know, you can, you can think about the two different contexts that we've been uh, thinking about in a very practical way. If we just specifically, you know, sp uh, pick on Sweet Home Farm where, where Don is working, the potential is that as Don and as Barry and others involved with him and see it and all those get involved in missional activity there, that whole community can be physically transformed into a safer, better place that more reflects God's goodness rather than a place of, uh, where sometimes there is violence and where there is injustice and where there is chaos into a place that reflects the character of God. That's the potential for mission transforming Sweet Home Farm physically. And it's exciting to think how we can journey with Don. And that's why you need to be come along this evening and listen to more about that. It's exciting to think how Lorna will have opportunities more within her work to get involved in more healthcare things because as she does that and as they get involved in the computer training and the other life skills, lives are transformed. Communities are transformed. Now, sometimes it's easier to think about that in another context. But why? Can we also not be excited about that here? Here for Bears Den and Mulgai and the surrounding communities as well. To say that as we are missional in our lifestyle, as we care about people, people will come to, into a living faith with Christ. And as they do that, their lives will be, be, be transformed. They will, know, they will have lives focused on living out the gospel in a, in a caring way, in a selfless way, rather than a selfish way. So that as they go out into you know, the streets of Glasgow, they will care about the homeless people that Simon is talking about. And as, as people are cared about, the, the society gets transformed. That's why I was excited, you know, what I wanted, when we were discussing um, this series, I asked, can I kick off with some of the Old Testament stuff? Because that sense of Israel being chosen by God so that they could be a missional nation to transform the nations always excites me. And it's that sense of God calling upon us is to know him so that we can make him known so that the some of the terrible injustices and, and messed up things about society can be transformed, can change, because it's about our whole lives being involved in people's lives. So we, we need to be excited about this. We need to be excited about the power 
of the gospel to change things. This is not some small thing. This is not just some empty words. This is not some empty ideology that we come up with or some latest idea. This is the one true living God who has sent his son to die for us on the cross so that our lives can be transformed so that we can get out there and transform. And God is able to do so much more than we can ever ask or imagine. In fact, Jill, you spoke on that last week. I'm going off script here. But if we jump into um, Ephesians 3, there's a wee bit of a benediction type thing there, isn't there? Um, that uh, this is a good way to finish. This is, this, this is God's saying, uh, this is God's message to us. Um, uh, uh, David, I don't know whether you can manage to get Ephesians 3, um, verse 20 and 21 up, but this is, this is a good way for me to hand over uh, to Liz for us to close with a time of worship. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work with us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Why don't we get hold of that phrase, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than, we are, than all we ask or than we can even imagine. What are we imagining for this community? What are we imagining can change here? What are you imagining for us as a church? 